Are fund managers really the persistent bastards they claim to be? Coming up. When we talk about the uh, performance of fund managers in private equity, uh, one of the things that comes up a lot is this question of whether a fund manager is able to replicate his performance from one fund to the next. In other words, it's referred to as a fact whether there is persistence in, uh, in private equity. And of course, it's in the interest of a GP to argue that if he's done a good job in a previous fund, he's able to replicate that in a future fund. And that is a little bit the common wisdom that um, the best fund managers or the fund managers who've had a good fund or a good performance for a few years are able to replicate that going forwards. But is that really true? And what is the real evidence to this anecdotal wisdom? So in order to make this video, I looked at some of the past literature on the question of manager persistence. And uh, a lot of it was about how managers in a certain quartile, like a top quartile, or a second quartile, and it was about the probabilities whether the, a manager who was in the top quartile on their next fund would go to the top quartile or the second or the third. And there was a, a few studies, they were all a bit inconclusive. There was a little bit of suggestion that in venture capital there was some correlation, but none of them were very conclusive. And so I, I thought I would look at a few more recent studies that went into a little bit more depth. One particular study that uh, caught my eye was done in 2018 by a group centered on the um, Technical University of Munich. I'm just checking my, my information in my computer. And they did a study of uh, 4,000 uh, managers, individual managers, working in 800 firms across 10,000 deals. And these were all buyout deals in the, uh, in the US and Western Europe for the most part. Um, the deals on average returned 1.4 times cash, average holding period was four years, average deal size was $30 million and it was in the period 1983 to 2013. And so these, uh, this group uh, applied a few quite high powered statistical methods to this sample to try and discern some patterns. And one thing they were looking for in particular was whether there was more evidence of uh, persistence among the individual members of staff of the fund rather than the firm. And so how did they do that? Well, they used some quite high-powered statistical analysis methods. They adjusted for bias and reporting, meaning the firm, if somebody's left, is, is likely to say that the people who are still there did the deal rather than the person who's left. So reporting bias by firms, they allowed for that. They allowed for NAV distortions in case of non-exited investments and they also allowed for survivor bias. And then they did an analysis of the managers, or they profiled the managers, and they did this by industry expertise, geographical focus, the size of investments that particular manager was working in, and then for each manager, they looked at his managerial expertise, which was managed according to the age of the person and the amount of years they'd been in private equity. And then they also looked at the managerial education which they measured by the university pedigree, whether it was Ivy League or Oxbridge, for example, or a second tier university, that was one variable. And the other variable was whether they had an MBA or some other kind of advanced finance degree. So looking at all these variables, they performed this study. And let's have a look now what they found. Okay, so we've described the study, uh, and it was a pretty rigorous study. You can actually find that on the internet quite easily and download it and read it yourselves. But the conclusions of the study were quite interesting. They found the following, that uh, industry expertise was very high on the list to explain high performance. They found that geographic and investment size expertise was of secondary importance. And they found that managerial experience and education had no correlation whatsoever. So it was really about the, the expertise developed on the job, as it were. So that was one interesting conclusion. The other interesting conclusion was that the, um, the correlation of the effect of the individual being persistent in their performance was four times more powerful than the firm. So that's a pretty strong argument because if the key people in a certain firm leave, leave and go to another firm, then that firm will benefit. So it's more attached to the individual partner, deal partner, than the firm. And that's an important conclusion. 
And then uh, the last part of their conclusion was how strong is this correlation? And they divided the deals into three groups, into three terciles. And if you look at the table here that you can, you can see here, they found that the probability to move from being a top tercile performer to going in, staying in the top tercile was a 40% probability. So 33 being the kind of random figure. And going to the middle tercile was 32, which is more or less equal to 33. And the bottom was 28. So there's a slightly more probable that you'd go from the top tercile and remain in it and less probable you drop to the third, but not, not a huge, you know, not, not a huge, but it was statistically significant. So the interesting conclusion of this was, was the, the effect of the manager being four times more important than the firm. The study we just looked at was in buyouts, and that was in buyouts in the US and Western Europe. Now let's have a look at another study that was done in 2020. And this was of, of the venture sector. So, uh, you know, the Americans divide private equity into buyouts and venture without really having growth as a secondary, as a, as a principal sub-asset class. So looking at venture deals. And they studied venture deals in the US market only in the period of about, of about 50 years, actually, from 1961 to 2008. And they uh, noticed that the fact that uh, returns in venture tend to be more binary in your portfolio. You might have an IPO that will do very well or a trade sale that will do very well and you'll have a lot of write-offs. And so they allowed for that in their study. And they also found that other studies they had looked at previously showed that venture capital had a higher persistence correlation than buyouts at 0.7. And the other thing they noted was that there are persistent differences with individual partners within the firms, which sort of links to our buyout study we looked at before. So they, so they studied these deals in, in quite some detail, and let's look a bit at their findings. In the conclusion, I don't really show any of the numbers because they're a little bit dry in the case of this, uh, in the case of this study. But if we look at the conclusions, one of the things they say is early success improves access to deal flow. So what their study is suggesting is that if you're in the right place at the right time and you make a name for yourself at the beginning, you get a kind of momentum because people will be attracted to working with you. The entrepreneurs will want to work with that firm because they'll see that firm getting involved as a signal to the rest of the market. So, so, so access to deal flow seems to be the main benefit of an, of an early success. And their studies showed that this uh, initial success persisted until about 60 investments were made. So we're talking until about fund number four or five probably and then the firm would tend to revert to the mean to go back to the average and um, another interesting conclusion was that um, there's always the question of uh, uh, are you backing the horse or are you backing the jockey and they found it wasn't so much from choosing the right investment or nurturing but basically getting in at the right place at the right time maybe getting into silicon valley in the year 2000 for example. And the other thing they noticed was that the firms who had had an initial success in venture would change their investment strategy and go away from the seed side of financing and go more to the later stage and syndications, which means that they had, let's say, more purchasing power in the market because they could still get into deals at a later stage because of their name and they could allow other VC funds to take the risk of going bankrupt at an earlier stage and wait for the companies to see if they would survive. And so but the, the main caveat of this is that the whole, this whole construction of the success and the way these firms would move and benefit from their success depends upon the supply of venture capital exceeding the demand. And that's really, really, really true in Silicon Valley and very few other places. And secondly, the ecosystem doesn't translate. So in other words, if you've built up a, a powerful name in Silicon Valley and you want to transpose that to Germany, for example, that may not quite work in the same way in terms of the benefit from the name and the brand. And you might have to start from zero along against the German VC firms. Another important point that you would find in private equity is always the question of emerging managers or first time funds, first time fund managers. And these are part of the ecosystem. And there's often a question by LPs saying, well, we don't want to invest in a first time fund because they're not proven and would rather stick with uh, a developed manager who's on fund number four or five because we're more confident that they will deliver. And so it's always interesting to address this point also in the question of persistence because uh, what is the role of the, the emerging manager? Can they also persist? And if we look at this study by Cambridge Associates, it's quite a recent study, you see the pale green. Those are the rankings of the first time emerging managers being 
to find as managers who are on fund number one or fund number two. And as you can see, they consistently rate in the top 10 across, across the years. And this is a sample of VC firms out of the US. And so the evidence would suggest that um, emerging managers are just as able to be persistent in their performance as any kind of uh, established manager, which is good for the industry because it allows space for renewal in the fund management teams. Another big uh, debating point in private equity is what's the best kind of profile you should have when it comes to the profile or the professional profile of the GP. That will differ within buyouts, growth and venture, but there's always a debate about um, should the GP have a financial background, so be kind of an investment banking uh, skill set, or should the GP have operating skills? And there's often a debate saying, well, a GP should have an operating background, and others saying, well, a GP should also have investment banking background. Obviously, it's self-evident that being a fund manager is a third profession. You're neither an investment banker nor a full-time manager of a company. But it's interesting to look at this study that was done by... Um, uh, by CB Insights, which is a slightly unusual study, where they, they did a rating of VCs where the main staff had a background either from finance or as former entrepreneurs or former founders of companies. And they, did a, they plotted the performance of the respective funds and they found there was absolutely no correlation or suggestion that a venture capital fund who had founders predominantly as their principals did any better than a VC fund which had people from a more financial or consulting type background. So that would tend to debunk the myth that um, you know, a, a founder uh, being a part of a VC team is intrinsically better than somebody from a different type of background. Okay, so we've looked at some of the literature. We've also looked at some of these uh, quite recent studies that were done. There was the, the 2020 buyout study, the venture study, the Cambridge Associates Emerging Manager Study, the study looking at the difference between founders and financial backgrounds. And so can we really draw any conclusion uh, from this and the literature? Because it's important if we want to understand how the private equity ecosystem really works. If you're a good fund manager, can you really replicate that? And so I would say based on these studies and my obviously my own experience as a GP, I think it's really hard to discern a really consistent, credible pattern. It's not necessarily the case that if you've been strong in one fund, you'll be stronger in your next fund. But there are a few things that do emerge in a consistent way from, from this. The first one is the importance of the individual professional in the firm. So if you are a strong uh, partner in a firm, then that counts more than the firm. And the one study showed that it counts four times as much. So that's one important thing. You have to look at the, you have to look through the firm at the principles in the firm. The second um, thing we can get out of it is the importance of industry knowledge, not necessarily being an industry focused fund, but if you are a deal maker in a private equity firm, you probably want to stick to a few industries where you've got a track record, not necessarily be a mono industry specialist, but you need to know your industry, either yourself or you know, through an ecosystem of operating partners and connections. So the industry knowledge, however it's deployed, is important. The, um, the third point we can get out of this is um, the importance of distinguishing in the firm's strategy between backing the horse and backing the jockey. So what does that mean? That means that it could be I just want to get into a certain sector at a certain point of time in a certain place. Like we want to get in to the internet in California in 99. So I just, any team will do, any business plan will do. We just need to get into the market and then we'll figure it out as we go along. That's one strategy, backing the horse. The other strategy is backing the jockey which means we have to be happy with the management team and the strategy. And, uh, you know, where we are in terms of the segment and where we are in terms of geography is secondary. So do you back the horse or do you back the jockey? One of the evidence is that if you back the horse, you can build quite a brand for yourself if you get in with an early success. So that's the third factor. The fourth is that there's an inevitable reversion to the mean. So as the years go by, you've had a few good funds 
But inevitably, as the firm develops, the years pass, competitors enter the market, the ecosystem shifts, you revert to the mean, you'll revert to an average performance, and that's sort of inevitable. And the study showed that after about 60 deals, which is like after what, fund four or five, you will revert to the mean. The last conclusion, or the second last conclusion rather, is that the brand does count, the firm brand counts to some extent, or the individual brand counts. Um, and that's particularly the case in VC, but that's subject to the condition that there is a surplus of capital. So there's more money chasing deals. And therefore, the entrepreneur can choose a brand name VC versus a non-brand name VC. So that's really only for Silicon Valley, in my opinion. And then finally, the studies show that emerging markets do have a legitimate place in the ecosystem. And I think part of that links to the fact that the individual is four times more important than the firm. In other words, certain individuals may leave their firm and go and set up their own fund. And that's where most emerging managers come from. Okay, so I hope you found this interesting. We're trying to dispel some of the mythology about persistence in private equity. So if you found this video interesting, please subscribe to my channel, hit the like button, and see you next time.